Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, a return to in-person textile-related socializing, an update on my sweater in progress, an unboxing, and a sewing update. So let's get started. This tidbit is a reminder of a tidbit I shared with you last week, which is I will be the June program speaker at the Minnesota Knitters Guild June program. You do not have to be a member of the guild in order to attend the meetings, and we are doing them virtually via Zoom. So if you would like to see me do the June program, I'll be talking about this journey I've had on knitting a sweater from each decade of the 20th century, what I've learned so far, and um, as well as sharing the projects that I have knit so far. So if that is something that is of interest to you, that will be a Tuesday, June 15th at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. So it's pretty late if you are in Europe or Australia, but if you are here in North or South America, you might want to join in. So I will leave a link down below so you can get more information about that. This next tidbit is a bounty event that is going on this weekend. And it came to me, this tidbit came to me I think it was in my Ravelry group that someone mentioned it to me, uh, but it is a virtual mill tour of the John Arbon Mill in the UK. So they have different virtual events that are going on throughout the weekend, um, but regardless of whether or not you go to the virtual um, event, they have a virtual mill tour that you a video that you can watch on their website at any time, and I found it to be the most um, explanatory tour of a mill that I have seen so far. Usually when you see these uh, videotaped mill tours, they're showing equipment and they might use lingo that you do or do not know, um, and they go through it pretty quickly. But in this particular mill tour, John Arbon, who <laughs> the mill's named after him, he goes through each one of the machines, tells you what it does, um, get, shows you it in operation, and then just takes you through the whole process of how wool is processed in their mill. I found it really interesting. So I'll leave links below to uh, their website where you can find information about the virtual uh, event for this weekend, as well as just that video on their mill tour. This next tidbit is about an online event that will be taking place on June 9th. And again, I will leave uh, links to that information down below. This is an Eventbrite event. There is a cost associated uh, with it, which is $15. It is, uh, it, the event is six women, uh, Barbara Brackman, Mary Kay uh, Waldvogel, Julie Silber, Alden O'Brien, Debbie Cooney, and Lynn Bassett. They are going to discuss and bust common quilt myths. So the description of the event is, was quilting a common task in colonial America? Did quilts pay a, play a role in the Underground Railroad? Did Amish quilt makers put deliberate mistakes into their quilts? The six know-it-alls discuss these hot topics and many more. So if you are a quilter or interested in quilts, that might be something that you are interested in. This next tidbit, I believe, came to me once again through my Ravelry group. This week, I was terrible about uh, keeping track of where I found out about these different events, but I believe it was through my Ravelry group. And it's about the Knitting Hope Project. So there's several links that I'm going to provide uh, down in the show notes that have to do with this particular project. The Knitting Hope Project collects stories about women and men who knitted to survive during the Second World War. The project also seeks to create contemporary designs based on these hand-knit items. One such item is the Little Red Dress, knitted in the Shanghai China Ghetto during World War II. 
for Judy Fleischer Kolb, who was born there after her family fled Germany in 1939. Kolb's grandmother knit the dress for her. It was eventually donated to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. There is a story about this that was uh, published on MDK, Modern Knitting Daily, which used to be Mason Dix Dix Dixon Knitting. Um, so there's a story about this particular little red dress. I'm not sure that that description that I read was entirely true because one of the articles I read said that the family was uh, were refugees in Shanghai in 1939, but that the woman who the dress was knit for was born here in the U.S. in 1940. So it could be that her grandmother knit it uh, in when they were in Shanghai and then she wasn't born until they got here. I'm not completely sure. Regardless, there are several articles about this little red dress and about the project A Knitting Hope. But in addition, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center where this um, dress was donated is having a tour on August 1st that will include being able to see the original dress and talk to the woman who the dress was made for. She's 80 years old now, so she will be there um, to uh, talk to people as well. And there's also an opportunity to do some restoration on um, some of the copies of the red dress that are in part of their, uh, they're called teaching trunks. When my kids were in school, I did some training at one of the museums that had locally where you take a, basically a suitcase full of artifacts or objects and you teach uh, the kids in the classroom about some particular topic. And then they might end up going on a museum trip at some later time, but it was a way for them to understand sort of history, but by having actual objects in their hands. And, and it could be about art or it could be about historical events or whatever, but it looks like that's what their uh, teaching trunks are, that they include one of these little red dresses in one of those teaching trunks. So if that's something you're interested in, whether you're in Illinois or just would like to read more about uh, the Knitting Hope Project, I will leave links down below. This next tidbit came to me in my Twitter feed. It is a link to a blog post on Kate Davies Designs, and it's the Sock of the Week. And it, this is Sock of the Week number two. There was also one last week, and which is equally as delightful as this week's. I will leave links down below. This week's Sock of the Week is actually a pair of miniature stockings that were made for a pair of dolls that are known as the Lord and Lady Clapham. They are held by the Victoria and Albert Museum. These dolls do not appear to have been intended for children to play with, um, and, but they include complete clothing from their underwear all the way up to, the, to all of the different layers. But what's really interesting is their little stockings. So they're really fancy and they would were very similar to each other. Lord Clapham and Lady Clapham's stockings were very similar to each other. Her blog post has a number of photographs of the dolls in different states of dress and undress. So I'm going to include links to not only the Kate Davies blog post, but also to the Victorian Albert Museum. So for each of these items, they, Lord Clapham and Lady Clapham are separate, although the, there's a lot of overlap in the photos for each of them. So you'll be able to see quite a number of photos if you're interested. I, I just thought it was really amazing. And what was so interesting was a lot of times the underclothing isn't something that survives to this day. And so having these replicas of underclothing um, is really informative and interesting to be able to see. This last tidbit came to me, I believe also from my Ravelry group. It is, a, it's a link to a story about a knitted version, completely hand knit version of Sandrigum a house, which is like the, one of the Queen's residences in the UK. So there's this woman, Margaret Seaman from Great Yarmouth, spent two years crafting her version of Sandringham House and other buildings. And so they're on exhibit currently in the Norfolk 
Makers Festival at the Forum in Norwich um, until June 11th. So if you happen to be in that part of the UK, that might be something that you are interested in seeing. Her goal was to find a way to use knitting um, to help raise money for different charities. So the, the funds that for um, this exhibition are going to three different area hospitals in Norwich. So it's, it's amazing to see the amount of detail and the, sort of just the scale of what she's done. I've always loved miniatures and looking at miniature houses. So this to me is sort of the ultimate to see that it was not only a miniature house that's completely duplicated, but that it was knitted. I started doing the Casual Friday podcast at the beginning of 2018. And it was in response to really missing a talking about knitting uh, with other knitters. The my technique videos are really demonstrations of specific techniques from the standpoint of someone with some expertise about this particular technique. So it's very direct and very focused on that technique. But I really wanted to talk about knitting in other ways. I had belonged to a knitting group uh, several years before, but our kids all graduated from high school right about the same time and the group just sort of dissolved. So I no longer was in a weekly knitting group and the yarn shop where I had uh, been teaching for years had closed at the end of 2016. That's why I'd started doing weekly technique videos in 2017 as a way of, of teaching in some way. So 2018, I really felt like I wanted to talk about knitting with other knitters in, in, a, in some other way, in just like what I was discovering or what I was learning about things I had questions about, um, connections I was making in different textile uh, fields. I, I just wanted to talk about knitting and I, and I didn't know what that was going to look like or how long it would last. So, but in addition, I decided I really needed to get back out in the knitting community that I realized how important knitting community was to me. So I certainly interact with a lot of knitters on Ravelry. Um, that is one way of having community, but I just miss sitting next to other knitters and seeing what they were doing and talking to them. So I decided to make a concerted effort to put myself out in the knitting community, in the local knitting community. Uh, and in addition, I had this goal that I wanted to learn uh, more about different wool breeds and experience knitting with them. And so that was a couple of different things that I wanted to do. It was in the spring, it was in May, that I went to a fiber festival hoping to look for yarns made from other wool breeds when I realized that really what I needed to do was to learn to spin. And I'd been avoiding learning to spin for 13 years, like I'd actively avoiding learning it. <laughs> um, and part of that was because I had been focused on, the, on finishing the master hand knitting program and I didn't want to be distracted from it. But I had finished the master hand knitting program several years earlier and I just out of habit, uh, don't want to learn to spin, don't want to learn to spin. So just about this time, in 2018, I was preparing to take my first spinning class and it was through the Weavers Guild and I was fascinated that the Weavers Guild was gonna have a retreat uh, later in the year or, or the Federation of Weavers Guilds throughout the state were going to have this retreat in the fall and I decided to sign up for that. One of the ways I'd gotten myself back into the local knitting community was to go to the knitting guilds uh, retreat earlier in the year and I had such a fantastic experience with that. I really felt like it was important um, to do that as soon as possible in the spinning community. So I went to this retreat and I met a couple there, Neil and Charlotte, and Charlotte noticed my sweater and could tell I was a knitter because not everybody who spins or who weaves or who dyes, which is what the, these guilds are all about, not all of them knit. A lot of them do not knit. So she recognized that I was a knitter and she hooked me up with their knitting group. It met every Wednesday at the library. So, I'll, so when the retreat was over, I uh, decided to go to the knitting group. 
And the first time that I was there, you know, there's a lot of people and, you know, I, it's hard to try, you're talking to the people next to you and then you see some faces and you can't remember everybody's name. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of people and a lot of things to try to digest. But one of the things that was happening at that first uh, get together was they were passing a card around to a woman named Joanne who had just had surgery. And so they were wishing her well and I had no idea who she was. And over the next few weeks, there would be different faces would show up um, at the knitting group. And there was always some familiar faces, but some people were there sometimes and some, um, some weren't. So I was used to new faces all the time. And one morning, this woman walks in, she had a very, you know, outgoing personality and she's wearing this uh, hat, this knitted hat that had, I recognized the yarn, it was a pink uh, and purpley yarn, it was the, one of the Zauber Ball Crazy Balls. Uh, I recognized the yarn because I had made a pair of socks from that same colorway. And not only had I made a pair of socks, I was wearing those socks. So that was, the, I did not realize that this was Joanne. This is the woman who had had the surgery. I just, it didn't click with me, I don't think at the time or even necessarily months later. There's just so many, so many people and trying to keep people straight and um, that I, I hadn't really clicked with that. So when the pandemic started, we uh, we couldn't meet at the library, but once the weather got a little warmer, we were meeting over the summer uh, at a at a local park uh, on a lake in a with a, a roof over it. So if it, if the weather was hot or rainy, that we would be protected. And we continued a meeting until about middle of August, and then the weather got too bad. So we haven't been able to see each other since the middle of August. Well, during the winter, Joanne got sick again and then was in hospice and she died, I think in February. This week, we, our knitting group got together again for the first time this year. And again, at an outdoor park, we're gonna continue doing that this summer. And one of the members who's very organized, she's the one who tends to organize a lot of these things, she had in her car all of Joanne's remaining yarn that hadn't been given away yet. So she had containers of her yarn as well as a floral loom, um, a couple of other things, and we were invited uh, to take anything that we wanted. I almost <laughs> took the floral loom. Uh, I was, it was like, I don't need this. I, I want it. I don't need this. Um, I don't have room for this. But then Neil and Charlotte, the ones who'd originally invited me to the group, showed up and Neil is a weaver, a dedicated weaver and spinner. And so he said he, he was going to take it, which is a little bit of a relief. But uh, we're going to miss Joanne. She was really, really an effervescent personality in the group. Um, so, so I miss not seeing her, but it was so good to see other people and just be able to talk about, ab about things, um, and finding and, and being able to talk to people in the group that I know so, and are very good sewers and be able to get advice from them and talk to them about that. Making, being able to make those connections in person, it's just so valuable. So I'm really grateful for that. Then the second thing that is it, like... I almost feel overwhelmed with socializing this week because I have two things going on. Tomorrow, there is a, an outdoor fiber festival event that's going to take place at a yarn shop that's outside of the Twin Cities metro area. It's about an hour drive northwest. It's in a town called St. Cloud. It's called Rocking Horse Farm. And I've been interested in this yarn shop for a long time. The Twin Cities, we have so many yarn shops. We probably have 20 different yarn shops, at least in, in our metro area. Uh, I have within five minutes, two yarn shops, and then a third that's 10 minutes away. You know, I just, there's so many. And this yarn shop is far enough away that I haven't had an excuse to go up there, but I've been very interested because they sell spinning wheels, fiber, they um, also sell knitting machines and they have circular sock machines and they have classes on those topics and uh, get togethers a couple of times a year. Um, so I was really uh, wanting to go up there. So I called my friend Celeste, who I also met at that a Weaver's Retreat 
And I said, I'm going to go up there. Do you want to, do you, do you want to come along? She said, yes. And they're going to have an outdoor spinning circle. So I haven't done any spinning since the pandemic started. So I, I was already making a plan to get back into spinning. I was telling you guys last week about this kit that I bought off of Etsy um, that I, so I can do a breed study. And it's just one ounce of each of the different uh, types of wool. And there's 30 of them. So I, so I'm really excited about that. So we're going to take our wheels up there. We're going to sit outside. I'm going to get back into, into spinning and be able to talk and ask advice and, um, and just be able to enjoy, enjoy that. And then in addition, I'll be able to go into that yarn shop and kind of see what they have. Um, it potentially at some point I might be able to take some classes up there. I have a knitting machine that I haven't used for years and years and it probably needs a little maintenance and it might be fun to take um, a class up there at some point. So I'm just so excited <laughs> to be able to get back out into the knitting community in a safe way and um, when it's summertime and just being able to see everyone. I'm really looking forward to this. So for my 1960s vintage sweater project, I finished the buttonhole band and the right yoke of the sweater. So currently I have the back done, uh, the right and left front, plus the button band and buttonhole bands, and then the, the yoke that is formed in ribbing at the tops. And on top of that, I have part of one of the sleeves done. So one of the things I've been worried about with this sweater is whether or not I have enough yarn. I've really been uh, weighing the yarn. I, I know how many stitches in total the sweater is going to have, and I've been keeping track of how much I've been using as I go and how much I have left and whether or not I think I'm going to make it. So I, th I think I will barely make it, and it's, it's close enough that I'm not comfortable knitting the sleeves completely completely from the bottom up. The, the sweater was designed to be knit in pieces, bottom up and seamed. The sleeves are a pretty large percentage of the project. Each sleeve is 20% of the entire project. So it's, it, they're, they're significant. They're always surprisingly large, uh, I think. And so I talked in the past few weeks about a couple of different approaches I had for how I could knit the sleeves. One was to knit them each completely top down and the other was to knit um, just the sleeve cap bottom up and then to knit the sleeve top down and that way I could maximize the yarn usage. So I've had a couple of suggestions. Well, you could knit the sleeves three quarter length if you're worried about the yarn quantity and that is the plan if I don't have enough yarn. I don't want to just knit the sleeves with three with a plan of three quarter length because I don't like three quarter length sleeves. Uh, the sweater as it is will be of limited use to me because it's made from fingering weight and there's only really a few weeks a year when a sweater of that weight is useful to me in the climate that I live in. I usually need a heavier sweater. Three quarter length is really, really not useful. I do have one sweater with three quarter length sleeves. It, it's a sort of a cardigan. It meets with one, a hook right here. It was a Nora Gone design that I fell in love with. I'm really happy I knit it. I rarely wear it. Uh, the most wear I ever got uh, out of it was when I took it on a trip with me and my daughter to the San Francisco Bay Area in the spring uh, a number of years ago. And it, because that's a climate where you have to keep taking things off and putting them back on because just because of the kind of the temperatures that that city has. So that's an ideal garment for that climate, but I live in Minnesota, which it, it, for me, it's just not a useful garment. So I really want full length sleeves if I can get them. I would even go for a seven eighth <laughs> um, length of a sleeve uh, just in order to, to maximize the, the amount of coverage I can get from that sweater. I will show you overhead uh, what the sweater looks like at this point. And, um, and then hopefully I will be able to get it done in the next few weeks. It's taking a long time. This is, sweater has 102,788 stitches in it. And uh, I am only about two thirds, just over two thirds of the way done because of how, how big the sleeves are in terms of percentage of this project. 
So I marked the location of the buttons to get them sort of evenly spread and counted the number of rows. Most of them have 26 rows between them. There are a couple that have 28. This is where the button band ends and the shaping begins, but this is where the shaping begins for the yoke. And so I really needed to extend this a few more rows. And so I did that in here. So this is longer. I think it's going to um, go around this corner and, and fit a stretch a little and, and fit better at the top. So this is the, the place where I will uh, cut and knit a few more rows and then hopefully be able to graft without it being disruptive in the edge here. And that's the, that's the part that I'm really worried about is that it's going to show up uh, right here at the edge and I really don't want to. So if, if I make a real huge mess of it, I will just uh, re-knit this part, which, ugh, but I'll do what I have to do. This is the sleeve cap. So you can see I have live stitches on a, a thin needle right here. This is like a size zero needle that is just holding the stitches here. So I, st I cast on right here. I use Judy's Magic Cast On and you use two circular needles. And so you're creating loops on each of the needles. I needed 112 stitches uh, for this sleeve cap. So I had to create 112 loops on each of the needles. So I'm, uh, many people use Judy's Magic Cast On to start a sock toe. So if they needed 24 stitches for the sock toe, they would have 12 on each of the needles because they'll be working in the round. And I'll uh, put some videos to Judy's Magic Cast On up here and then down in the show notes as well. Um, but I needed 112 on each needle because I needed to be able to work 112 stitches flat in this direction on one of the needles and then keep these all live right here until it's time to work in this direction. So when I work this sleeve, when I return to working this sleeve, I am actually going to uh, join it in the round. I'm going to work the sleeve in the round and I will decrease out two stitches immediately. Uh, what that will allow me to do is to work two stitches less per row because I won't be needing to seam and that will preserve a little bit of yarn um, for um, the project. J I think just enough yarn to, to be able to complete the sleeve uh, all the way. So what I will likely do is uh, I started uh, the sleeve with a new ball. I will start the other sleeve with a new ball. The balls do not start with exactly the same amount, but I will I'll work each of them to you know an equal place and I will just manage the yarn to make sure that I have the same amount for each sleeve um, so that I can get them to be the same length in the end. So if you're wondering why I would knit this sweater, if it's not, if it's something that I wouldn't get that much use out of, it's because it's part of this larger project I have of knitting a sweater from each decade of the 20th century. So when I pick a sweater that I'm going to knit for a given decade, I look for something that's sort of emblematic of that decade. Like if you look at this, would you think, oh yeah, that's a very, you know, 60s type of sweater or something. And this particular style really is. Another thing I'm looking for is the construction method. What kinds of construction methods and techniques are used in this sweater that are unusual or different or that um, can teach me something? And that is what the yoke of this sweater um, is all about, as well as the shaping of the sleeve cap was something unusual that I hadn't seen before. So, so this is what I'm getting out of um, knitting this particular sweater. And in addition, uh, the yarn came, this is a vintage yarn and it came with a skirt length of matching handwoven tweed fabric that I will be making in, into a skirt. So all of this is part of that project. So the third consideration that I have is choosing something that I think I would actually like to wear. So, you know, I, I have varying success with that. Um, but if I think that the garment really typifies that decade for some reason, and it has something really interesting about the construction, and it really helps tell the story of how fashion construction and techniques evolved in the 20th century, that is more important to me than will I wear this sweater. 
So this just came in the mail this morning before I started uh, filming Casual Fridays. So this is the breed study kit that I ordered. So I thought I would open it up uh, in front of you. And so I, I started the sides. Okay, so. So this particular breed study kit, uh, this was the last one in their shop, but there are lots of Etsy shops that sell uh, breed study kits. So you can see that there's different colors, different natural colors, a lot of cream colored, boy, these, some of these look really bright. I'm just going to dump them all out. And then we will take a look at what there is. So, oh, and it smells like, I just love <laughs> the way wool smells. It smells so good. So there, oh, this is one that I am really interested in. These sound great. Some of these I have heard of. Some of these I have not. I see the Zwart Bliss. I made a sweater from Zwart Bliss earlier that I finished earlier this year. Um, I've heard of Rom Romney. I've knit with Rambouillet of a friend with a sheep farm, and that's the kind of sheep that she um, raises. I have knit with Corey Dale and Icelandic. Uh, and I've actually even knit with Manx Lotna. I knit with a blend that included this and I just loved that yarn. The yarn was from a Canadian company. I think it was called Ancient Arts. I'll put the name on the screen, but it was a blend and I just loved it. And I looked up the sheep and it's, they're these sheep that have so many horns. They're just, they're from the Isle of Man. I'm really excited about this and I feel like, like an ounce is a manageable quantity. So my plan is that I will spin uh, the yarn, uh, spin probably a two ply and then knit it up into a swatch. And then as I go, I will create a blanket. And so I'll probably have to see how big the swatches end up and decide as I go what size those uh, squares are going to need to be. Um, but I'm really excited about this. Look at this. Uh, this is like salt and pepper looking. It's so, and then this is more of a brownie color, same kind of thing, but brownie. It's just so fascinating to see uh, the natural colors. And here's the Zwart Bliss. These are like black sheep. And then there's a, a Jacob that's really dark too. So there's a few that are dark. This is Welsh finish. So this is just fantastic. Ooh, this is really interesting as well. Swaledale. So um, this is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to this project. So I got some, some fabrics. I went back to this uh, fabric outlet that's just so overwhelmingly huge. And I f found this fabric again. I remembered where it was. I, I got a map from them and I noticed that it was located in the nerd fabric <laughs> area of the store. So this has math equations on it. So I, I love math and I was a, a math major for a while in college. It was computer science and math and communication, all kinds of things. But uh, I just love this. It's got triple integrals on here and it's got uh, derivatives and it's got trig stuff and geometry. It's got all kinds of cool stuff in here. Um, so I, I loved this and it came in a bunch of different colors, but I decided to get, um, to get this purple one. And then the other uh, fabric I got was this and this looks kind of like orangey but this is actually a very like true like a blue red it doesn't show up at least on my monitor it looks kind of orangey and then i bought some t-shirt fabric which also looks orange but it's in fact a blue red um, and i bought enough of this i can probably make a couple of t-shirts i really love red um, so I, and I like wearing red t-shirts. One of the tips I got from watching sewing videos over the past few months was that when you wash your fabric to surge 
you know, the ends, the edges so that they don't fray and tangle up. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I did that and it worked fantastic. Uh, so I loved that tip. So one of these skirts, I don't know which one, one of these skirts will be a straight skirt using the sloper that I created from my own measurements. I did a mock-up with muslin a few weeks ago. And so I'm gonna make that skirt uh, with real fabric. And then I wanna modify that sloper to create some wedges in to make it um, uh, a swingier skirt. This is probably the one, I don't know which one I'm going to do that way, um, but I, I do love this fabric. So this is probably going to be the swingy one since I got uh, the t-shirt the fabric for it. Uh, I also saw this fabric when I was there is just so cute. And I have a grand nephew who's a couple of years old and I wanted an excuse to use this fabric. And I got a, a t-shirt pattern. It was the same company that made the t-shirt pattern I had made for myself that worked out pretty well, except that I made some construction errors. But when I cut cut it out, I looked and the neck seemed super small. Um, and so I found another pattern that had a, a neck that was a little bit bigger and I, so I, I trimmed the neck hole for that. It, the, the other opening was so small and this kid's head is so huge. <laughs> There's no way it was gonna go over his head. So that will get finished this weekend. Last week I was telling you that I had my grandmother's sewing machine that I retrieved when I was in Michigan. So I was doing side-by-side -side comparisons with my machine. So this was my grandmother's machine that she probably got in the 1970s. It had a few more bells and whistles than mine, but not enough to make it worth switching. And mine had been serviced a year ago. So it's in really good running order. Um, my grandmother's, you know, has the one foot that's on the presser foot that's on the sewing machine. It came with several others, but they're nowhere to be found. Uh, and I noticed the hand wheel is a little stiff and I'm assuming it's because it just sat for years and the oil probably gradually, you know, sunk down and so it needs to be oiled. So I went to the sewing machine uh, place where that serviced my machine last year and looked to see if there were feet available for my machine, uh, my grandmother's machine, which is a Ricker. And it's a Japanese model that it's an Indonesian company owns it now and they mostly make vacuum cleaners. But what's interesting is that this sewing machine place also sells vacuum cleaners and they sell that brand of vacuum cleaner. <laughs> They're familiar with, you know, they've been in business for, you know, decades and decades and they did have a package of feet that would fit that particular machine. So if I find somebody that wants to, wants that machine, then I know um, where they can get some additional feet that will work with it. They gave me some tips about how to go about cleaning it. They have all these machines that are like cut in half and they're showing me <laughs> on the inside, like here's where you do this and here's where you do that. And, and I did find the manual for this old machine online and where it says to oil. So I did take it apart and I cleaned all the old black gross uh, oil off of it. And I've been oiling it and then trying and then running it uh, without a needle in it just to, to keep everything going and then tried it again today and oiled it and there's like one place where it's kind of like stiff and I think that's probably the place that has the least amount of oil so I'm going to keep working on it uh, over the next week or so I keep um, shuffling the machines around in here in my office because um, I don't have room to have uh, a serger and two sewing machines set up at the same time so I just work on my grandma's machine uh, every day to see if I can get it um, to to run a little smoother. So there is somebody in my knitting group whose daughter is learning to sew and she needs a machine that does a little bit more than hers does and my grandmother's machine would do that. So if I can get it in working order so I don't have to invest a ton of money in order to, to have it be actually useful to them, I'm going to do that. Otherwise my niece might want it. So she would probably really love having something that belonged to her great grandmother because she lo loves the family history aspect of, of items and she's very crafty herself. There is a future for my grandmother's sewing machine, I believe. In the meantime, I'm just uh, plugging away on my stuff slowly and surely. And 
you know, it's just a very different approach to sewing than I am used to and kind of adjusting to, oh, this is, this is sort of a, a better approach in order to get a good result. So it's, I'm taking things slowly and then trying to remember, oh wait, what am I supposed to do with this step? Because normally I would just cut the fabric out and follow the directions uh, and I would never practice. I would never know to do anything differently than whatever the instructions say. So it's been kind of a process to just kind of get used to the rhythm of making something and maybe doing some things in a different order than what a pattern says if I have come across a better way of doing something. So it's a, it's a fun process and now I'm going to be adding spinning to the mix. <laughs> so I'm, that's another thing I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to rotate through these things and make consistent progress um, in in each of them at the same time. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.